right, good evening, everybody. We'll begin with our special board meeting for Monday, May 13th. Mr. Ristgazian, if you could call roll, please. Mr. Fashionetto. Here. Mrs. Patrick. Here. Dr. Shively. Here. Dr. Beck uh -huh. Dr. White. Here. Mr. Bruschuti. Here. Mrs. Levy. Here. Mrs. Schenkel. Mr. Alozzi. Six, six members present. Thank you. Uh, if you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And if you please join me in a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. We'll begin with courtesy of the floor uh, on agenda items only. There's only one agenda item, that's the budget. So if anybody would like to speak on the budget, now would be the time. Seeing none, uh, we will move right in. We have no minutes to approve tonight. I have nothing to report at this time, Dr. Silva. Any no update? report. Excellent. Any unfinished business? Seeing none, that takes us on to our one agenda item, and that is the adoption of the 24-25 budget. So I'll look for a motion and a second, and then we can certainly have some discussion on it. Dr. White, motion. Dr. Shively, second. Um, Dr. Silva, Mr. Aristakasian, anything to add? Before I turn it over to Mr. Aristakasian, I just want to thank the board for its hard work and its, um, its guidance during the previous months of uh, budget season. As we uh, la launched on back in January when we started talking about this budget, it really comes down to three major areas. Uh, what we choose to spend as far as our expenditures and our programs, what we ask of our community to contribute in terms of millage or increased uh, expense or increased revenue, and what we are willing to use from our savings or our fund balance or any combination of those three areas. And I think we've uh, f found a resting spot that is a, uh, asks for equal sacrifice and brings our budget into balance as is required by Pennsylvania law but I will let Mr. Aristakesian get into the details of what that means in the terms of this proposed final budget. Thank you, Dr. Silva. Um, it's been a pretty exciting budget cycle, actually. There's been, on the heels of the constitutional unconstitutionality ruling, a pretty sizable increase that's been proposed by the governor. And since then, we've gone back and forth to many different sessions. Uh, and depending on the timing of the session and who's in the meeting, you get a slightly different answer in terms of what that final budget might look like. In the beginning, we were at 75%. There was lots of optimism. This is the year to address things. Show me the next slide. But <laughs> as we went to more and more, it, it almost became more of the unknowns. And so there's lots of uncertainty around the governor's proposal. Um, there, there's a lot of positivity around BEF and SEF. What nobody seems to really put a finger on is the timing or amount of the adequacy funding. So the biggest piece of the unknown is how do we address the lawsuit? Um, lots of discussion around cyber charter reform, um, lots of optimism that this year it's all going to be addressed. Part of me wants to say we've been here before. Uh, will this actually be the year? Will that really be addressed? Or what, what will happen? Remember early in January, we were talking about interest rates going down and you know we're worried about deflation well interest rates are still up where they were and inflation is just as high as before um, the one thing that i think people that i've spoke to have agreed to is the state is unlikely to pass the budget in time for us to pass our budget on june 17th the other thing that everyone has somewhat agreed to there's going to be some additional funding what that additional funding looks like and how much is, is the big big unknown if you will so given all the uncertainty, we've had to make some assumptions. Next slide, Jamie. Um, our assumptions are based on the governor's proposal. So we're going, as we've done in the last meeting, 50% of BEF, adequacy and SEF. Uh, we're keeping charter reform at 12,000 fixed. New debt of 20 million or approximately 20 million for construction of the new Fountain Hill. Uh, real estate millage increase of 3% after the rebalancing. Um, Title I adjustments will be made based on our ap applicable levels. Uh, and then we're going to utilize 6.5 million 
to balance the budget from our fund balance. So put in these assumptions um, and the unknowns that are in place, we'll, we will have a balanced budget. And obviously we'll revise that budget once we get more factors in before the June deadline. So what does all that look like? I mean, I think May is supposed to be a different color. That's my fault, sorry. The one in the middle of that, May, um, is what we're talking through now. And I kept April on there as just a comparison point. Uh, you can see local revenues are at 229 million, um, state and federal are, are slowly behind that. And we're gonna have a total revenue of 353,204. We've updated our instructional expenses and support services and all the other expenses that go with that. So projected revenue of 346,746, the general fund transfer of 6.45 million gives us the balanced budget of 353,204. Uh, and I left on there the pieces and charter expenses. So you can see how the charter school expenses and the mandated costs continue to rise. So in a really high level snapshot, that, that's our budget. So what does all that mean? Next slide, Jamie. Um, that's our projected revenue. As I said, there's a use of fund balance. There's a balance in the impact of the 3% millage increase from last time is $5.5 million. Where does that break out to the average taxpayer? Well, we did some math. And based on the average residential assessed value, Northampton County is at 62,300. Lehigh County is at 142,450. You can see what the tax bills look like and what the increase over year would look like based on the millage rates. Then I did some homestead calculations and the homestead calculation numbers that will increase based on the gaming revenue. And you see the net impact to the taxpayers of $53 and $16. And essentially just comparing the last year versus this year, that impact with the millage increase and the average taxpayer on the residential value will be $53 and $16. So what's next? Well, we have to post a budget and make it publicly available. Uh, we will do that tomorrow. And the special board meeting to adopt the budget is on June 17th. If there's any factors that change between now and that, Obviously, we'll account for them. Um, and that's pretty much it. Is there any questions? Mr. Risky, please, you can go back to the previous slide. Uh, one before that. At the bottom, that's, that's really where you see the impact of this budget as being announced. dollars and 20 16 dollars and 29 cents <clears throat> we also had good news from uh, Pennsylvania in that <clears throat> uh, gambling revenue although I'm not a big fan of gambling I am when it produces a lot of revenue for property tax reduction so <clears throat> the amount of property tax reduction is pretty close to the amount of tax increase so for the average person uh, the effect of money out of their pocket will be very minimal <clears throat> and it'll allow us to maintain our academic programs. It'll maintain our ability to stay on a multi-year track towards our spending priorities, whether that be future construction projects, future collective bargaining agreements, and it will keep us well within our average range of our use of fund balance or available fund balance. So on all three of those big areas, uh, this budget keeps us where we like to be, uh, managing the sacrifice throughout the organization, but also some shared sacrifice in our community. Other questions, other concerns, comments on it at this point? Obviously, this is just a formality of what we're doing. We can change anything we want between now and June 17th. But looking at this slide, it's nice to see the homestead um, rebate continue to grow from where we started, way down $120, $140, I think, in the first couple of years. But if you look at that increase over the previous year of $107 in Northampton County, which is where the majority of our residents, residents are, and obviously that's the average summer, less summer, more, that's the impact of what we have going on in Harrisburg right now and them not being able to commit and not being able to address the lawsuit that was very clear um, and address and be willing to act on the governor's budget in a timely manner. I fully believe that we have responsibility every year to raise revenue slightly, whether that's a small property tax increase or through the state support or whatever it is, it's not responsible not to, everything goes up, our electric bills go up, fuel goes up, labor costs go up, 
And we've been able to hold steady for four out of the past five years. And we've been able to do that with increased state support, getting us to where we should be at. And we're still nowhere near fully funded. So you can imagine if the governor's budget was even adopted at 75%, the amount of tax increase necessary would be lower. The amount of revenue would be higher. Um, so there is, the, I mean, these are the real numbers behind what's going on. When you think it doesn't matter or they're never going to agree to something, this is what it boils down to on the average person is $107 or $70, depending on where you live. Um, happy to see the homestead go up and decrease that to 50 bucks and 16 bucks. But um, yeah, so hopefully we'll have some changes before June 17th. I highly doubt it, but we have to keep, keep going forward with increasing our revenue to keep up with everything else going on. Dr. White. Just clarification, that's in addition to what you're paying now. Is that what you're saying? The yes. 53, thank you. Yep, the 5329 is, if you took last year's tax bill and added 5329, that's the increase after the homestead and everything else. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mr. Shankle. I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time, but um, I just also wanted to follow up on that and say that um, even with the budget and the lawsuit um, apparently passed through um, in the Senate now is the school choice mm -hmm. voucher program, which is even more um, disheartening that this is getting passed through while we still have yet to figure out how to address the, you know, the, the um, lawsuit and everything. So yep. just mentioning, Absolutely. thank you. Anybody else, Mr. Rusciutti? Um, Mr. Fast, now you mentioned it, 3% uh, increase, is, and we haven't had one, what, three out of the last four years before this. Mm -hmm. uh, that's well below the rate of inflation and our expenses have, have increased. So I think it's a, a fair number, the way we've balanced it, cut expenses, use some of our fund balance and the 3%, I think it's a very fair way to do this for our taxpayers. Yep, agreed. All right, no other Questions or comments? We have a motion, we have a second, then we'll call roll on item 701, which is the proposed 24-25 budget. Mr. Fashionetto? Yes. Mrs. Patrick? Yes. Dr. Shively? Yes. Dr. White? Yes. Mr. Rusciutti? Yes. Mrs. Levy? Yes. Mrs. Shankle? Yes. Mr. Losey? Yes. Motion carries 8 0. Thank you. Uh, any new or miscellaneous business from anyone? Seeing none, courtesy of the floor. Anybody wishing to speak? Yes. Come on up, please. Mrs. Muller. Start over. There you go. Good. Trisha Mahler, 728 West Market Street. Is that better? Okay. Um, I came back to since last week um, to update you on our uh, public education advocacy day trip um, in conjunction with the resolution that I that was proposed last week. So it's in connection um, to everything we're talking about here. Um, and I just wanted to give my personal feedback. Um, Power Patterns as a group, we haven't gotten together yet. So this is just a reflection from my um, experience last week on Wednesday, May 8th, we went to Harrisburg with a group of 70 people, um, mostly students from our district, middle and high school. Um, we were also joined by Mayor Reynolds, um, Karen, Dr. Beck Pooley, um, Dr. Roy came with us, uh, Foundation Board Member Matt Malozzi, um, Northampton City Count County Member um, Jeff Warren. And I name all these people, I put a note to self here. They showed up not as community leaders, but as parents and concerned citizen. But just to kind of give you a broad view of who um, came with our group in particular. Um, so the day was set up that we met with a couple of our lawmakers, and then we had a lunch rally and another session, you know, boom, boom, boom kind of thing. Um, the meetings with the legislators, um, we brought our students in, introduced ourselves, shared our stories of how more money can impact their education. So this, the, the children, the students shared their stories. Um, then we also gave them an ask. They gave our legislators an ask. Um, the ask was in particular, 
you know, with all this funding. Um, Wednesday, when we went, May 8th, uh, 24 hours prior, the House Dem Democratic leaders circulated a co-sponsorship memo. Uh, let me start that over. Co-sponsorship memo um, to really solidify uh, the, the proposed governor's budget to make it a seven-year plan, like really invest in our future. Um, this proposal was would be transformative and also it was reflecting all of the major recommendations from the BEF commission. So it was, you know, it's a win-win. So our groups, this is a big ask for any of our connections of Advocacy Day. Um, our group came in to ask our lawmakers if they had signed this, and if not, would they? And more so, can you get your colleagues to also sign? So that was our kind of, Intro, share stories, big ask to our um, lawmakers. I, I wanted just to give you, uh, you know, feedback on what we experienced. Um, I was in the room with um, Representative Freeman, McNeil, and Samuelson. We did a joint meeting with them. Um, they are very supportive of public education funding and the governor's proposed budget. They really took to heart our students' stories. Um, that our our students rocked. I, I just wanted to share how proud we all are of our students. They were on point, they were with heart, and they really made a difference. Um, in fact, the legislators encouraged our students to keep using their voice, um, not just in the district, but here locally to visit the legislators at the local level. And so that's on our checklist to do. Um, in particular, the, the room I was in, um, McNeil had already signed the co-sponsorship. This was like four o'clock on Tuesday, this went in and we were, we were there 10 a.m. on Wednesday morning. McNeil had already signed on. Um, Freeman and Samuel Sin were just learning about um, the proposal and like immediately they were on board. They were very supportive of it. Um, in fact, Representative Freeman went off on his own, called his office right then and there and said, I'm on, I'm going to sign it today. So I share all this to say that our students really made an impact and a difference. Um, it was a whirlwind crazy day with things getting changed in the moment. But our students were, as I said, were with heart, were, um, you know, they were children, but they were so professional and they were flexible and, and they were just a wonderful representative of our, of our district. Um, a rally of over 600 people attended from more than 20 different advocacy organizations. The theme was finish the job, fund our schools. Um, Rep Representative Samuelston gave a tour to our, our Bethlehem School District children. Um, and so I just did a bottom line. So that was the full day. Why am I sharing all this to you? Um, and I, I feel very comfortable. I, I, I feel the positivity for public school education coming from my school board. And I'm very, very blessed to you know, be part of this. Um, but I, I still wanted to share our stories and you know, make a bigger impact here with, um, with our proposals that people came from Erie to Philly to Lackawanna. I wrote down all the Loser, Luzerne, Monroe, all these counties to, we rallied and had 83 meetings with lawmakers of which we were part of. Um, we sent a clear, loud and direct message that Pennsylvania's in every corner of the Commonwealth valued education and we are united to demand that lawmakers do their job and fund their schools. Um, so part of me is to just give you feedback, obviously to say what we, we're part of and your children were part of, but also to encourage you to, you know, accept the, the resolution um, to support our schools on a, on a state end. So thank you so much for giving me this time. Excellent, thank you. And, and Tracy shared an email earlier that had a PDF full of pictures and everything. And I think she's gonna send it to the whole board so you can take a look at it and see how many students were there and really well represented. And it was a, a wonderful opportunity. Excellent. Sure. 
Excellent. Thank you. Anyone else care to see the floor? Yes, ma'am. Come up, give us your name and address, please. My name is Megan Baker, and my address is 1718 Chester Road. That's Thank you. Me. I'm a little short, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if this is the appropriate place to have this discussion, but uh, my children are children of East Hills Middle School. And I'm sure that all of you are aware at this point that two of the individuals that work within East Hills Middle School have been pulled from their positions and are being investigated for inappropriate conduct with students. So all I would say is that being a personnel matter, we can't discuss, confirm, deny, sure. say so, anything. So I would just ask you to, out of respect for anybody, just to leave names, positions, and very... Right. Understood. Yeah. The reason that I thought maybe this would be an appropriate space was the policies. So right now, when I contacted the school district, I asked what the policies were around student engagement with teachers on social media platforms. And though I was told it was highly dis discouraged, there wasn't anything that solidified the fact that students should not be engaging in social media platforms that didn't have to do with school related activities in a casual setting. So I think it's important that we continue to protect our children because these are powerful positions and it's very valuable to them to understand that there's a difference between a mentor that cares about their education and their advancement and someone that has alternatives. And in this example, I didn't feel like our policies are intact enough to protect the kids in the way that they need to be protected. I mean, I have five kids in the school district Mm -hmm. no, go. Yeah. I have five kids in the school district, three of which are at East Hills, one of which is at Freedom, one of which is at Moravian Academy. The reason that I chose to put the last one into Moravian Academy is because I don't trust the way that East Hills is being handled and haven't for a while. My kids are completely involved. They're in band, they're in football, you name it, they're in it, they're in the gifted program, all of them. They're doing well, but I don't feel as though the school is protecting them in the way that they need to. So I'm just here to say, I think it's important that we evaluate our policies so we can hold people accountable when they step over gray areas so that the kids feel protected. One last thing is when this was brought to the school, I'm not gonna name names, when it was brought to the school, the children that brought these issues up were then brought back into the guidance area and told pretty much you're not to say another word cease and desist and i learned that from the vice principal and the idea that children are recognizing concerns within the school and raising their voices to say this is a concern to me and are being told by the people that are supposed to protect them you say another word and you're in trouble we're telling them that they don't matter. Their feelings don't matter. Their fears don't matter. So it's very important that we validate who they are and what they're experiencing. Because we don't want to act as though, oh, another adult is our friend. So we can say like, oh, that's, this is a vicious rumor. It's not a vicious rumor. It's something very serious and their feelings matter. So it's important that we protect them with their policies and we hear them with their voices. Because at the end of the day, what are we doing this all for? but to empower the students. So that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments, courtesy of the floor. All right. Seeing none, anything for open forum? Seeing none, motion to adjourn. Mrs. Patrick, second. Mrs. Shankle, all in favor? Aye. All right. We are adjourned and we will roll right into our finance committee meeting. Mr. Ashuti, it's all yours. All right. Uh, first uh, item on the well, finance committee meeting for tonight, called to order. Uh, first agenda item is public comment on any agenda item. All right, seeing none, we'll move into uh, 2.01, the Bethel Maryville Technical Schools Articles of Agreement. Um, uh, Mr. Fastenau, do you want to give us a little history on this? Sure. Um, so as you know, we've been talking for years. Uh, I've been on, at Votech for 15 years. We've been talking for at least 10 about an expansion project. Uh, um, the expansion project really got 
some more steam under it about 18 months ago. Um, but what our main issue with, and you see there's a copy there attached, and I did send this out, the Articles of Agreement. The school was founded back in 1965, and I promise this will go quick, um, between Saucon Valley, Northampton, and Bethlehem. The original Articles of Agreement, which formed the school, lasted for 30 years. After 30 years, 1995, they were again renewed for another 30-year term, which you can do the math, expires next year in 2025. There have been two changes to the articles, one in 2000 and one in 2008. Both of those were dealt with quorum issues. One lowered the quorum from six to five. And then the second one um, at the request of Saucon Valley and Northampton so that Bethlehem couldn't just go in with five and roll all over everybody said, well, if a quorum's five, we need one affirmative vote from another district to take action, which we agreed to at the time was fair. That was just before I came on board in 2009. Um, those have been the only changes. We have never had a discussion about the funding formula, about the way the articles are set up. They have been that way since day one, and they have always worked. It is a blend, as you probably have heard, of market value of the district, meaning how much wealth is out there in the sheer property value of the district, and then um, the number of students on a three-year rolling average who attend. So um, if your student enrollment ticks up over the years, your, tuish, your tuition rate that we call it, um, you see it on our monthly budget items, is going to go up um, when the budget season comes around. If your enrollment starts to decline or is flat, it's going to stay about the same. The only fluctuation on that is the market value of the taxable property. Um, when we began to talk about the expansion, all three districts were seemingly on board. Um, Saucon Valley was initially on board um, and then kind of backed off a little bit. And we are ready to move forward, Bethlehem and Northampton are, with an expansion in the tune, you know, the larger of the two expansion options, uh, a little over $40 million, $45 million, and it keeps growing the longer we delay. Adding over 300 seats, new programs, really bringing Votech up to the, where we need to be now and reacting to the job market in the Lehigh Valley. Um, it takes all three districts support. It takes a majority vote of the boards of all three districts, so the nine of us, the nine in Northampton, the nine in Saucon, to renew the articles of agreement, which have to be done in order to borrow money for 20 or 30 years, most likely 20 years, and also to make any kind of changes or borrow, or I'm sorry, um, go through with this construction project. So we have two factors. We need the support of all districts to launch a construction project, to borrow money for the said project, and then to <clears throat> renew the articles of agreement for another 30 years. I see no reason to go shorter. Saucon Valley has requested numerous times in the past year that we look at a solely student-based tuition formula, meaning take the budget, divide it by the number of students, you have a tuition rate, and if you send 500 students, you pay the same amount for each student, taking away the market value. Currently, Saucon Valley, Saucon Valley has a higher market value, not higher, higher per capita or um, than the other districts. They're a very wealthy district as far as tax base is concerned. So they are paying approximately 12% of an overall budget, and they have a utilization rate by students of somewhere around between 8 and 9%. About 10 to 12 years ago, they were in the low 60s of number of students. This year, they're up over 125. So they have continued to grow, and on top of that, have a higher market value um, per capita than, some of, than the other districts. So they, in turn, are paying an extra if you look at it, 3% of the budget where their students are not utilizing. So they have requested to go full, just plain old tuition. Um, the other two districts have fought back on that, saying that this formula has worked. We're not going to be reactionary to a one-time problem um, or an issue that just is an issue with the current board or a past board. Um, we've had 59 years. This formula has been in place. It's never been questioned. Uh, when it renewed in 1995, it was... The president of the VOTEC who signed it was a member of the Saucon Valley Board. Um, I don't know what the issue seems to be. We would actually, in Bethlehem, we would save a little bit of money every year. Um, Northampton would take the larger hit as far as it's concerned. But I think the reason it was set up this way is that if something happens or there is a drastic need for money, the roof collapses, you know, whatever it is, the ability of your district to raise local tax revenue directly related to supporting the school is the reason the formula was put that way. 
It is the way pretty much every other CIT or, or trade school in the Lehigh Valley and beyond uh, the local area is funded the exact same way. We're not doing anything that anyone else isn't doing. Um, there's been arguments about why can't we just do it like um, the IU? We just send the IU tuition. The IU gets millions upon millions of dollars from federal programs, from state programs, and then from sending families and school districts. So it's not the same. We actually own the VOTEC. It is ours. If the school closes, we would get money for the assets that are there. Um, so we are now I, seemingly at an impasse. They have requested negotiations. They've requested all kinds of things. And Bethlehem and Northampton have both said no. Seven out of the nine members of OTEC have said no, we're not interested in that. We are just continuing the way we are going. It has worked. It's not broke, don't fix it. Um, so we are at a point where we have to make a decision of what we want to do. The longer we wait, the more expensive this project gets. It's already gone up by two to three million dollars from when we originally wanted to do this back in the fall. It's going to continue to get more expensive, and it's also going to continue to put another year, two, three years of students not having access to the program. You know, we had uh, a lot of students this year, Dr. Silva, over 100, I believe, on a waiting list, 120, something like that, on a waiting list. I listened into the most recent Saucon Valley Finance meeting when they discussed it, and they had 60 sophomores wanting to go to the school, and they only have room for 55. So there are students in all three districts, Northampton included, on waiting lists to get into VOTEC. Um, we know all too well that career and tech ed is very important. There are high paying jobs. There is no tuition. Uh, beyond that, there is no college debt. There is no student loans. There's none of that. And they are high paying family sustaining jobs at 18, 19, 20 years old, or the ability to go to a four year college or the ability to go to other training or an apprenticeship program or a trade school beyond uh, high school years. So the opportunities and value of VOTEC have never been higher. And we need to do something between now and about the end of summer, because we talked to uh, Don Spry and the folks at King Spry, and they need five to six months to ramp up a renewal process for the articles. We cannot just let them expire. That would not be good. We're obligated under the school code um, to provide career and tech ed for students. So where does that leave us? Uh, it leaves us with a discussion of do we want to pass some sort of resolution affirming our stance? Because I don't know how many more times we can tell Saucon Valley that we are not interested in changing. Northampton has told them that. Um, Northampton had a big shift in their school board in the election, and they are still firm that they want to go forward with this, um, seeing the value of it. So there are two options. Option one is that Saucon Valley will agree with Northampton and Bethlehem and continue on as usual. Option two is that we would look to part ways with Saucon Valley and Bethlehem and Northampton would continue with the school. We could easily fill those spots. That would need to be a negotiated exit for them. Um, they would be entitled to a sum of money. I don't want to quote it, but Don Sprague talked about it at a VOTEC meeting and it was, I believe, somewhere around a million dollars, maybe a little less with depreciation value that they'd be entitled to. Uh, I certainly don't want to see that. I don't think anybody wants to see students lose out on a program but we cannot continue to spin our wheels um, for one school district um, when the other two, seven out of the nine on the committee are pretty strong with this. So I don't, I don't know what the best next step is. Um, Mr. Shudi was at the last meeting, Mr. Shankly, you were there, Dr. White, um, if anything you wanna add in, but I think whatever we do, I think we need to approve a renewal to the articles and approve a construction plan at the same time, because we are not gonna renew the articles and then have somebody try and block a construction plan because then what's the point? Um, but I think we are all done spinning our wheels here and we are ready to move forward with or without the other partners. Thank you, Mr. Preston. No, I agree, I think we have to put something on and I'd like to maybe if we can put on next week, if uh, a resolution on our agenda for both approval of that. Ms. Schenkel, do you want to give us a recap of the last meeting? I know I was there, but. Uh, yeah, so one thing to clarify, um, this has been going on for months, I think probably close to a year. Um, we have heard them out repeatedly. So it's not a simple matter of us saying, no, we like the way it is and we're not interested. We've heard them out, we've discussed, we've uh, gone back and forth. And you know, at this last meeting, we finally made it very clear, this is where we stand. Northampton was the same. This, we, heard their options, we don't agree, and this is where we are. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention with that is, um, you know, you mentioned like the 3%, but there's also an understanding being missed, I think, on the part of their members 
that some of the opportunities that their students have come from the a number of students that we send and, and the support that we offer as a district. And the VOTEC continues to excel. We are sending students to national conference competitions. We are winning awards. We are setting standards. Um, some of the work we have done is gathering, as I said, national attention. Um, and it, we have so many students who are waiting and wanting the opportunity to attend the school. Um, and I think that every meeting that passes that we just keep going around and around in the same circles is um, not good for anyone. So I completely support putting this on the agenda for next week. And one thing I forgot to mention, we did back in the fall, we haven't seen updated numbers, but we had numbers from PFM. Um, looking at the cost to each district with the current funding formula, the increased cost for the construction of both projects, whether it was option one or option two. Um, and I don't wanna begin to understand what the finances are like in any school district, but even um, I think the Saucon Valley increase was $80,000 a year um, with a higher plan. And obviously, as Scott Shear always does, these things are projected out all 20 years of the borrowing. It's not that it's gonna change after one year. It's not a, um, the floating notes like we have now where every two years we're coming back. It was the guaranteed rate going forward. It was budgetable. You knew what it was gonna be. There was not looking at changes. Um, so everything was there. I, I don't see it as a matter of excessive cost. It's just something that they are not comfortable with for whatever reason. And Ms. Fassner, you touched on what I wanted to touch on. If we change the formula, it does change every, it's a three-year average is what they use and that's what they propose. Um, I have two fears with that. One, for budgeting for us, if we do take out the it's about $45 million debt right now, 46 million, whatever, it does hurt us in budgeting going forward because we have a fixed number then of what it's going to be on that. The other issue I would have is and you can get a promise maybe from Saka Valley now if boards change, if they, and I don't know if they can do it legally, but even artificially put in enrollment caps within their school district about how many kids they're gonna send there, it's going to inflate our numbers. So while their proposal may lower our number initially, in the long run, it's gonna cost us more money probably uh, over the term. So those are some of the concerns that I, I, I had about the whole thing. All right, so I'm not sure if uh, we need them motion to put something on for next week or? I want to thank Mr. Fascinetto, Mr. Shankle, and Mr. Schutte for their good summary of the situation and where it is. Uh, just to make sure that this wasn't just something that the Bethlehem board talks about. Uh, Mr. Aristakesian was in uh, consultation with our bond council and had some information relevant to Saucon Valley's request. In essence, I just wanted to follow up with them around our, our taxing authority and what does it take to go out and, and issue bonds? Because we're gonna be going out to debt, um, there has to be a general obligation or promissory note, <coughs> excuse me. And what, what he said is it's very unlikely that you will be able to get funding assets of using market value. There's a small chance that it could be done, but then you become unrated and it creates a lot of unnecessary complexities. Through talking to him, uh, he was actually pretty, pretty forthright in saying, well, we're already kind of compromised because you're using enrollment as part of the factors and most others are using just pure market value. So his opinion was the compromise is already in place. Um, the template that was put in place in the early 60s follows the standard that was put in place when those CPIs were established. And he was strongly suggest against changing that. Um, so it would, it would just create unnecessary hardship in terms of going out to borrow in a very unlikely scenario. All right, so do we need a motion or anything to put? We can just say. Yeah, we're and just talking to Mr. Estacasian, like, I don't know that we have time to draft something and get everybody to say yay or nay in time for next Monday. We have a June budget meeting on the 17th, which will fall slightly after the VOTEC meeting, which I believe is on the 14th or 15th. I know it's pushed off a week and a day because of graduations right. and other boards. 
Um, I don't know if that's too late. Um, the next VOTEC meeting, uh, we asked uh, Saucon Valley to bring us a new proposal, not the same numbers that they've had before. So we're still in a pro process of one more try, I think. Is that right? I feel like by the end of the meeting, we had said, for, I, like, yeah. I don't, I think we pretty much I, I don't said think they had another proposal that they're going to bring forward other yeah. than this. Okay. And I, I think it was pretty made, much made clear. And, um, I think Ms. Mrs. Shankel said, well, you know, we have to talk then about all our, our, you know, Bethlehem and Northampton alternatives if we have to move forward without Sock and Valley on this. Right. Yes, and, that was where we ended. Was and I believe uh, and our solicitor is going to be the same solicitor. So I think they're going to be preparing a kind of legal memorandum setting forth what the procedures for both because I think if we are ending the vote tech as it is now, I think he said it's a five to six month process to wind it down. There's a lot of moving parts because they have leases and other obligations and pensions and whatnot that have to be um, taken care of, <laughs> I guess, and, and made sure that, that th this new entity, if it's just going to be us in Northampton, is going or, or guaranteeing to pick up those obligations going forward. So I think that's the, the where we're at with that. I believe if Sock and Valley were to agree to those terms, though, it could be an amendment. It wouldn't have to be a dissolution followed by a re. So one thing we all did agree on is that the absolute last thing we want to happen is to have the dissolution of the agreement. That that is, you know, really what we want to prevent and avoid, yeah. but yes, to um, Mr. Rizzuti's point, it would take um, at least five or six months working backwards for that to happen, you know, for them to be able to figure out what they need to figure out before that point. So, um, I mean, I think, you know, if we were to put this together and have it on the Zoom meeting and be able to let everyone know at that OTEC meeting, it's not a bad I think it's a good thing to move us forward. Yeah. We've been so stagnant, and that's really the, the way we wrapped up the meeting was we can't keep doing this anymore. Yeah. So I mean, today is Monday. Might as well call it Tuesday at this point. Um, it would have to. We'd have to have a resolution drafted. We would have to have the nine of us, solicitor, Dr. Silva, Mr. Skazian, agree that it's a acceptable resolution by Thursday when the agenda posts. Uh, I think that's a rush. No, I'm saying that the June 17th. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. Yeah. Um, our June calendar is interesting because of graduations. So we would not have a meeting on the 3rd. We would have a meeting on the 10th, which would be before the VOTEC meeting, which I believe is the 12th. Mm -hmm. So if we could have it on um, the facilities agenda or a curriculum, it doesn't matter for the 10th. That would be us. We could be able to have it presented publicly. Our public support could be recorded. Um, it could be delivered to them on the 12th or to that meeting. And then certainly we could put it on our special agenda tied in with the budget, which is not a bad place to have it on the 17th approved and over with. And I go both ways on saying this, but it's public knowledge. Saucon Valley had their chance to talk about this, to bring ideas. The prior superintendent of record was the superintendent of Saucon Valley, and that person chose to come to two of the 11 or three of the 11 meetings of superintendent of record. We've always had a superintendent of record seated at every meeting just to give advice, to give the perspectives um, as the board's voice, um, because the setup is unique, not having a, a top administrator, you have an executive director, it's not the same. Um, and that superintendent was absent. Um, and beyond, I don't know what the behind the scenes conversations were, but um, going back to conversations with Dr. Roy, this was carrying on was he was here, it was similar. So I think the opportunity was there, the opportunity to bring a real proposal. I don't know what it would have been, um, but it, it some way had a tie into market value because as we heard for financing and borrowing and so many other reasons, there's just not a better way to do it, unfortunately. Um, so I think that the time is coming on. Um, I don't know what they would bring back in June, but certainly listen to it. I don't know how um, agreeable anybody's going to be to it at that point. Just for clarification, 
the resolution would be renewal articles with construction project number option two, the bigger one. Yeah, the bigger one. Okay. All right. Any more comments, questions on that issue? All right. There are no information items for tonight, so we'll move into agenda items for May 20th, 24 regular board meeting, 4.01. This is the PA School Board Association voting delegates. Um, any questions on that? We need to fill we in need the to names. nominate three spots for that. I'm happy to throw my name out there. And I'm I'm actually representing the Tony IU. I don't know if I could do both. Okay. Right. Dr. Bexler, I think has has yeah, it, in the it, past. It, Can we nominate her in abstention? <laughs> so she's currently serving as the treasurer of PSBA. Yeah. Oh, that's and right. I forgot about that. I don't know if it's a conflict. I know there was a point where I was asked to not be a voting delegate uh, several years back um, as an officer and treasurer is an officer of the organization. So I'm thinking she cannot. So we need somebody else. It's a virtual yes. meeting and in person. It's your choice if you want to drive to Mechanicsburg. Um, and it's Saturday, November 2nd, in case this is no time soon. You have six months to plan your calendar. All good. I'll, I'll stick with it. Okay. No. So do we need to nominate someone from from amongst our ranks here? I thought this was nominated. Oh no. Wait, you... I'm just asking because I <laughs> have a nomination ready, but I'm this is Shankle, Dr. White, and Mrs. Levy, you're good? Okay. <laughs> Can we nominate you and change it if you change your mind? Okay. All right. And I I I will say, having done it a few years now, the vir virtual, it's its not an extremely long day. It's two hours. There's conversation. Um, I'm happy to talk to you more about what it's like or what to expect offline if you're we're interested. So was Winston going to nominate me? Is that it? I was <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is correct. <laughs> how, how about we put the three of you down? Mrs. Shankle and Mrs. Lee, if you want to talk afterwards, and if something changes, uh, I'm happy to be an alternate. Um, but I've sat, I, I've sat through years and years of these. I feel it's somebody else's turn, and it, it is very interesting to hear um, what the association is interested in moving forward, what people feel is important on the platform, and it, it, it it's a good learning opportunity. It really is, um, and it's not bad now that you can do it at home on the couch with PJs for three hours and a cup of coffee. Quick question. Um, last year, I did the discussion that brought the slate air. Do we need another representative to do that as well? I think that comes up. Um, That'll be later then. I think that comes up closer in court to the time. Yeah, I, I don't think we do. I'm trying to, was that the platform committee? Were you that was, Yeah, I was on the platform committee. No, okay. um, we don't. Um, they look for members of the association to be on the platform committee, and I'm guessing that um, maybe I nominated you or Karen yeah, or somebody. Did. That was great. <laughs> we can make that happen again if you'd like, but yeah. it's not, every district does not have a seat on the platform committee. They have about 25 members who sit and hear those. All right. All right, so we have three names for 4.01. I'll be on the agenda for next week. 4.02, the summer food services for children. Um, Mr. Versace, do you have anything to add on this or is it just? A standard item. The only thing is that this year's dates are from June 10th to August 23rd. Um, so tentative dates, approximately a thousand different students are served across 30 plus sites. I know you mentioned changing the companies July 1st. Is that going to be an issue? It shouldn't be. So um, that's one of the agenda items on here yeah. in terms of the transition period. Uh, we have both vendors ready to go. Um, as soon as this meeting is over, assuming that the recommendation gets approved, we have a transition plan that we're working on. Uh, the caveat is one ends on June 30th, the other one starts July 1, and the food service is through between both programs. So we're going to have to do a little bit of coordinating with both companies. Okay. Uh, any questions on 4.02? 4.03, the 2024-2025 school breakfast and lunch prices, they're staying the same this year. Any questions? All right, that'll be on the agenda. 2024-2025 uh, Centennial School Satellite Food Service. Uh, is there any changes with this, Mr. Rizkazi? No, just continuing our commitment. Um, we have both Centennial on here as well as Bucksmont. Uh, we're trying to get them both on the same timeline. So this year you're seeing Bucksmont a little bit sooner than what we did last year. 
but it essentially ties them out to the 24-25 seat um, school year. Okay, so 4.04 and 4.05 will be on the agenda for next week. Is there any questions on any of those? Oh, yeah, just uh, are those the only two schools we're providing satellite service to right now? I know we used to provide, I thought one of the dual language charter school might have bought food from us, but that could be years gone. No, these are the only two so that we have, and, okay. and the only difference is one is paying us directly, the other one is responsible sites. All right. Any other questions on 4.04 or 4.05? 4.06 is what we alluded to, the award of the Food Service Management Company contract for next year. Um, Mr. Riscazin, do you want to, any, I know we discussed this. Yeah, so, so we, we've had, a, we have to go out at it once every five years to go out for an RFP. Uh, we've had quite a bit of interest, but we've had four companies show up um, to do their walkthroughs. Three of them submitted a bid. We've had a, a pretty robust taste testing and interview process. And while the taste testing was, was really fun the first meal or two, uh, it, got, it got a little bit much towards the end. Um, overall, it, it was it was very competitive and, and extremely close. Um, but we we as a committee have decided to move forward with the recommendation for METS, uh, effective for July 1 of this year, starting from next school year. All right. Any questions on that? I know beyond the July, uh, that'll the, that agreement will be on the next on the May 20th uh, school board meeting. 4.07, appointment of legal counsel, uh, appointing uh, Lawrence Fiziel, Gross McGinley and Service Special Counsel to provide legal services uh, necessary as a result of real estate tax assessment appeals. Mr. Riscazin, you wanna explain anything here or? Well, I, actually, uh, Lauren uh, is I here. I saw she is here. Uh, <laughs> so if we wanted to ask her any questions, but what we're looking to do is, is maximize our, our leverage around the one main thing we can control, which is our tax base. Uh, so we've been working with um, Lauren to, to really discuss options that are out there in terms of helping not only clean up the backlog of cases, but what do we do moving forward? Uh, and we're going to take a what I call a two-prong approach to this. Uh, so we've asked Lauren and, and, and Gross McKinley to help us with future uh, tax assessment appeals and represent the district, as well as um, if there's a assessment appeals from our end and taxpayer-initiated appeals. Once we get through that backlog uh, and, and work it from the front end, I think I will tackle the back end. Uh, we're hoping to clean up our list and, and really get, get a little more traction. Uh, I think what really stood out in terms of Lauren was, was her ability to communicate with me and, and discuss our process and, and kind of be a partner in this. Um, so I'm really optimistic about what the future holds. I don't know, Lauren, if you want to come up and maybe introduce yourself real quick. I just know Lauren is a Bethlehem resident, a local council also. She used to be my neighbor. We have backyards. <laughs> <laughs> I am not. I'm a Strasburg graduate, but I came to the best city that I could choose <laughs> outside of that. <laughs> so I've been in Bethlehem since 2011. And yes, Mike was my neighbor. So they decided to move away from me, which I I miss him very much. He was a very good neighbor. <laughs> um, but that is very true. <laughs> Um, but Lawrence Fizial from Gross McGinley. Um, we are a Lehigh Valley law firm, almost 50 years in the, in the Lehigh Valley and we represent many municipalities. Um, so we had a great conversation with Harry about the needs of the, uh, the school district with regards to its um, assessment appeals, um, what it is currently experiencing with some backlog, um, some of the um, issues that he would like to tackle going forward and came up with a plan as he mentioned about um, what that might look like and um, I think doing a very collaborative effort in identifying those properties um, in accordance with, with, with the current law and then making a decision as to how to proceed um, because as we know it's a multi-step process um, it can be um, very efficient but it can also be very lengthy and, and expensive so being able to have that con that conversation and being able to really pivot along the lines as far as um, understanding what we're looking at and the, with the goal of having them resolved um, in very short order with those filings and coupled with as low cost to the district as possible. I don't know if anyone has any questions for me. No questions. Well, I'm excited for the opportunity and look forward to working 
recommend everyone. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And that will be on the agenda for May 20th. 4.08, designation of our repositories for the year 2024-2025. They're all listed there. Any questions on those? All right, that'll be on the agenda. 4.09, board treasurer reappointment. Uh, reappointing uh, Mr. Pern as our treasurer again. Any questions on that? Frank, you sure you want to do this? <laughs> okay. Congratulations, Frank. <laughs> Uh, 4.10, the appointment of our tax collectors, no changes from last year. Any questions on that? So, being an area school district, you deal with a bunch of them there. So every municipality has their own. Uh, 4.11, renewal of our multi-factor authentication licenses. This is a very important renewal. As you know, many companies find themselves uh, receiving ransom terms when their networks or their systems are hacked. The authentication licenses that uh, we will be renewing here have, have worked in the previous year, even though you have to take that additional step to make sure it's you, it is far worth it. All right. Any questions on that? There's a few here. We'll just go 4.12 through 4.17. They're all renewal of various softwares. Any questions on those? All right. Those will be on the agenda for next week. And then we're up to 4.18 public school facility improvement grant application for the Lab Center HVAC renovation at Liberty High School. The next two projects are actually what were discussed in the uh, facilities committee. Yes. So th these are the two projects that um, we're going to be applying for grants up for. Uh, it's competitive grants, um, but we figured we throw our name on the hat, and if you can get a chance to do a project at half the cost, why not? The the catch is you have to commit some of our capital dollars uh, for those projects. So we, we see some of our fund balance dollars that are available. Of those dollars, we're going to commit, um, I believe on this one, uh, 8.021 million. So that means $8 million is going to be set aside if this project gets approved and we have the dollars available and ready to go. Um, and for the other project, we're going to be committing just over uh, $2.3 million. Uh, again, these are the, the two commitments that are going to go through for the grant. Uh, assuming we get approved, and it's just like playing the lottery, if we get approved, these are committed, ready to go, and we can move forward with the projects. If they don't, then the money will get committed back to our capital uh, project fund and we'll move forward uh, as we normally do during the summer. Mark, did I miss anything on that or? I think 4.20 is also a grant application for the same thing. Uh, well, the 4.20 is actually the summer projects that we've already started. Uh, we figured again, we throw our name in the hat, in the hat. And if there's an opportunity for us to get some commitment dollars, there's no additional commitment because we have the projects underway, uh, but they technically do not start until June and therefore they're eligible for the grant. If we get approved, great. If we don't, then we're doing the work on it. Just want to thank Mrs. Kowalczyk, our grants writer, Mr. Stein and our facilities department, Mr. Erstikesian. This is a lot of hustle. Uh, to eventually, you know, get a really nice discount coupon on some needed things re, uh, in our capital plan. So uh, if we were fortunate enough to be selected for one or all of these, uh, we're positioned well to take care of that, uh, uh, take care of that project. This continues a long history of this type of approach in the Bethlehem Area School District, which has allowed us to stay current and have other facilities that uh, we probably would never have had if we hadn't been so planful. So I want to thank all those involved to get this ready. Mrs. Lee, I just want to ask, um, how successful are you, the district, is with grant writing and so forth, um, percentage-wise? I don't know if you have that number. Per a percentage of applied <laughs> and received? And, and received, yes. I don't. Oh, I would have to find that out. Okay. Uh, I would say, without knowing that particularly, I just know anecdotally from other school districts and from other uh, superintendents that we are far more aggressive and far more uh, get far more windfalls from uh, planning the use of grants than other school other school districts. 
largely because we have the ability to do what we're doing tonight, to be able to commit funds that eventually would lead to a bigger discount if we were to have the pro uh, project. Not many small school districts can make that level of commitment. And I will add, not even the big ones can make that level of commitment. Um, um, this is the one of the few districts, school districts, that is, that actually goes out and competitively applies for grants, and, and that's partially because of the work that Mary Kowalczyk does. Uh, she is a grant writer. Historically, we take what we get as our allocations. Uh, with Mary on board, we actually identify grants and say, hey, can we get that one? Or what will it take to apply for these grants? So. It's a program that's somewhat newer, but we're getting pretty good results. Now, not millions and millions, of course, but we are getting good results in terms of our uh, application and approval for competitive awards. All right, any other questions on 4.18, 4.19, or 4.20? Those will be on the agenda for May 20th. Um, moving on to number five, 5.01, public comment. Anybody? Mr. Intalix. Stephen Intalix, 77 Ridge. I wish to compliment the board president for his consideration for, for those of us who are disabled in some form because of his superior use of the microphone. Um, he follows procedure of speaking no more than three inches from the microphone and then he'll turn his head to speak to other people while he's addressing the public. So I strongly urge all other members to follow the example of the superior person. Some, some of you have, um, I, I don't have a rule, I use my, my good vision to see that oh, you're almost a foot away from your mic and speak softly and this, um, this, this hurts. <laughs> okay, enough of that. Uh, I've been reading and hearing a lot about education and school districts, which most of the information is not pleasant. And it's caused a lot of concern on my part because I hear you people and I, your tensions are clear, but it has nothing to do with what I'm gonna say because of the con contrast. And what really bothered me was that 55% of teachers said they would not recommend the profession to other people. I mean, that's, uh, that hurts. And these are 55% of active teachers. Now, that 55%, is that all over? And from the top of anyone's head, what percent of the BAS teachers would agree with that assessment? Um, because I hear policies and discussions here, which are intended to improve education and those dis disseminating that information have, are losing respect for that profession. So there's, and the loser in all of that are the children. And the other thing that bothered me was there was an assessment of the schools and they looked at high schools. I, I don't know who did the study, but what concerned me was that I agree with the, with the district in their attitude toward charter schools, but people reading that article will get the idea that charter schools are better off because their children get, or will get a better education. So that's, that's very dangerous, very, very dangerous. And I think someone on the district here should probably write a letter, write an article 
to address that issue because there's a lot of inf inform misinformation there. And that needs to be addressed. And I think that a high official of this district should go after that and educate the public because a lot of damage has been done by that article. And I know, for example, I don't have much confidence, many of the reporters, because in different meetings and reading what they say about the meeting, there's a disconnect. Whether it's a bias intentionally or, or just they don't know what they're writing about. And I can confirm that what they're saying um, is incorrect, but it's in the public eye. And, and many people read the articles, but many people don't attend the meetings, especially like, like council meetings. But the thing that bothers me, um, whether to counteract, I guess the question is, And this is from curiosity and concern on my part is, does the BASD teacher group agree with the 55% that was mentioned in the article? But I hear teachers come here and speak glowingly. So uh, I'm confused and, and I need help in that area. So whatever you can do to, to help yourself in terms of counteracting that, I strongly urge you to do that. Thank you, Mr. Intellix. Anyone else for public comment? Seeing... <laughs> um, moving on to... Uh, Open forum, any member for open forum? Thank you. <laughs> All right, seeing none, motion to adjourn. Ms. Patrick, second Ms. Shankle, all in favor? Aye. We're adjourned two minutes for. Yeah. Where's the letter of transmittal?
by the end of summer. We got a 30 second warning. Okay, everyone, thank you for your patience. Um, welcome to the May 13th, 2024 Human Resource Committee meeting. Uh, starting off courtesy of the floor for agenda items. There will be another courtesy of the floor at the end of the meeting. Seeing none, we have some discussion items. Uh, we have some policies, board policy 918, Title I Parent and Family Engagement, first reading. Dr. Burris. Yes, this policy, you'll see that there are updates in bold that is due to federal updates and PDE guidelines. 
Uh, there will be a meeting in June with parents and principals, and then the information that comes from that will be shared with staff and uh, the school groups at the beginning of next school year. And then as things progress, uh, this policy then will be reviewed again this time next year. Wonderful. Thank you. Any questions or comments on this? Okay, you will be seeing this again. Uh, next up, we have 2.02 .02, board policy 706 property records first reading. Yes, there were two documents associated with this action item. The first one is the policy itself, the strikeouts, and then the bold new print is to clean up and make the policy more clear, as well as to bring it in lines with current auditing guidelines and requirements. So thank you, Harry, for your work. Great job, Harry. The Great second uh, attachment to this item is the directions and kind of guidelines for the disposal of obsolete and surplus materials and the various options that would be available to the district. So, Any again, questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Again, if you have any comments or suggestions to either of these two policies or attachments, uh, please send them to my attention and then we'll get those updated. Thank you so much. Any questions or any discussion on these? Okay, seeing none, information items? Yes, this item is the resolution that was presented to the board at the last meeting. Uh, there was not a specific title, so the action item, the wording that I put it in there was the highlights that I felt uh, were the main points of the resolution. So uh, unless you have other language, we'll keep that as the item for next meeting. Okay, so this is agenda item 4.01, and this is the resolution that was shared with us from Correct, Crown Parents. Correct, yes. Okay. Any comments on this? Okay, thank you again for bringing that to our attention. Um, the next four, if there's no objection, we'll take as one 4.02 um, Eastern University Agreement, 4.03 Millersville University Agreement, 4.04 Moravian University Agreement and 4.05 DeSales University Agreement. You can tell that university solicitors are telling their universities to get their agreements set before the beginning of the next school year. So these are existing relationships that we have and uh, they fit well within our, our academic program and our policies. Thank you. Yes, and they all have been reviewed by Avery. So they're good to go. Thank you. Any concerns or questions on these items? Okay, then you will be seeing them on May 20th at our regular board meeting. Um, quick meeting for HR today, so. Yes, but if I could just uh, take one minute of your time, just an update at next week's uh, meeting, you will see on for professional staff an additional 24 uh, recommendations for hire. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, 12 vacancies that are in various stages of the interview process. We do currently have one Dean of Student position that is vacant and uh, posted. We have three recent uh, vacancies that will be posted this week due to resignations or last minute retirements. And then we have six LTS positions that we will be interviewing for. But again, LTSs, long-term substitutes, those positions aren't typically picked up by candidates to later on because they're hoping for full-time positions, but we do have six currently posted. Wonderful. Update on the professional staff. Thank you so much. The good news is this is part of our goal as a district to get out earlier and have a bigger talent pool, a more diverse talent pool from which to choose rather than waiting a little bit longer and then finding ourselves not having uh, the option with as many candidates. So it uh, is a lot of work to be able to get early hiring, but to, to get the team signed up even before the end of the school year, uh, not only helps over the summer, but also will help with scheduling, uh, professional training, all the things that we like to do when uh, we sign up new employees. So good news that April and May had a lot of higher teacher hiring on. And I would like to thank the curriculum department as well as the principals for spending a lot of their time at taking the multiple steps in part of the interview process, uh, especially this time of year when they have a lot of other things going on. So I would like to personally thank them. Well, thank you so much. Um, next up would be courtesy of the floor. Mr. Antalix, notice how closely I'm speaking to my microphone. I didn't get a thumbs up or anything. 
<laughs> Steve Ann's Alex 77 Ridge. I like to say that this human resources committee meeting reminded me of Cole Porter's old song, Night and Day. Thank you, sir. You're welcome at our meetings anytime. Seeing no one else for courtesy of the floor open forum. Mr. Fascinetto. Uh, I was slow because I was reading something else, but for the resolution, is it worth, we usually insert like some Bethlehem language in this, a couple of whereases that talk about our current budget dollar amount and the amount we're underfunded. I know PA schools work just updated their numbers earlier. Like, is it worth saying we are, you know, with a $347 million budget and blank percent local taxes and underfunded by X amount of dollars or student costs, just to spice it up a little bit. Had a Bethlehem whereas paragraph? Yeah, just with some current budget numbers. I mean, it doesn't have to be crazy. This is I don't know if that gets away from the intent. I mean, I think it's a good idea. We've yeah. done that in the past. I don't. Yeah. Just to personalize it a little bit. Yeah. Well, Dr. I mean, White. this is this is a you know our constituency pain, mm -hmm. so I, I think it, it it's good for our voting public to know that this falls on our shoulders, so it it would be an opportunity for them to realize this is why they need to raise their voices at at the the voting booths as well as the polls now. Yeah, it just also adds some real numbers. Right. Yeah, um, and, and the point. numbers do exist. The numbers are good. With your permission, I'll have Dr. Burris and Mr. Skeezian and myself sort of put the language in the, where we think the right spot is on the resolution, and then you'll see that on the voting meeting. That sounds good. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Anyone else for open forum? Mr. Alozi. I got like three things. Um, firstly, so in our last meeting, I had asked um, if there was any data on those who we, I think, asked on the amount of applicants of color that we had that we had interviewed, um, and just kind of to know what that is. I am curious to know what that is. I don't know if that's something that we could, or let me not say we. I could ask for a report to the board on on such um, for one of our um, upcoming meetings. Um, I'd also be curious to know because now we're in a full year in to um, the new regime, a full school year into the new regime. So just curious to know what our attrition, um, turnover, all of that stuff looks like for this year um, in turn. So I'd like to have, I mean, again, it doesn't have to be, but just numbers and a couple words on that. We can add that to an upcoming committee meeting. We'll have a little clearer picture after the May hirings. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll make that as a, a goal before the end of the school year. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the third thing that I have, and I'll, I'll let it go, I understand that um, in the two meetings ago tonight, so in the special meeting that was at, at, at the start of this evening, um, a constituent, a parent in the district shared a concern. Um, and I do feel that it's important while making sure that all persons um, are innocent until proven guilty. Mm -hmm. um, and we also respect the safety of all children um, that we don't take, and which I'm certain that we don't, but just to say in a public forum, we don't take her, her concern lightly. Um, and I think as we continue to look through and, 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 and observe things and note things, just to keep that in mind, particularly because we here are not on the we're not on the classroom level and in the hallways and so this this you know although unfortunate it's a good education piece for everybody on what is the best way to handle something so sensitive and how that looks like in in different classrooms and in in public spheres or um communal spheres within the school building so that again we're protecting the rights of everybody involved Thank you for that. Anything else for open forum? Exec session, um, personnel, legal, that is all. All right. If nothing else, can I have a motion to adjourn? Dr. White, Mr. Alozi, Mr. Rashudi. Thank you, Mr. Thank Patrick. Thank you.